Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship as conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters, both new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. This podcast is also proudly presented by TNK Hunting Gear. If you haven't heard about TNK, then it's about time you do, everyone. I've been using TNK gear out in the field and on hunts and have absolutely fallen in love with their stuff. TNK is veteran owned and 100% made in America using only American made products. All their gear is covered under a lifetime warranty with no questions asked. If it breaks or fails, they will fix or replace it for free. TNK is a resource for bino harnesses, bow slings, and a lot more amazing gear. For more information about TNK hunting gear, go to their website. At T, the word and K, hunting.com. That's T A N D K, hunting.com. Or you can find them on Facebook and Instagram. Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Don't forget to leave a review from T and K and the Soulful Hunter. Freedom on and stay soulful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Today I'm joined by a co host. Two Shot Tony, my original hunting partner and uh, one of the original members of Washington Backcountry. We are here recording a wonderful Coyote Predator Hunting 101 episode with Minor League Predator Control. We got Andrew Witt over here to my right and Mason Browson here. <laughs> and we have been coming over here to, to do a little predator hunting. We wanted to get out of the house. It's not big game season anymore, so how do you become a better hunter? How do you just keep practicing on your skills? Coyotes are open year-round in most states, and there's a lot of things that you can do to help with predator management and the conservation aspect of all of it. So we wanted to get them on a podcast, talk a little bit about our experience with them predator hunting. We got Tony joining us because, Tony, you just shot your very first coyote last night. Oh, baby. <laughs> Yeah, so it's been a really good time. Got to experience uh, night hunting out here on some on some ranches and and all that. So, Andrew and and Mace, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell tell everyone how you guys started minor league predator control. How you got into predator hunting? Like, is it your favorite? What, where, where does it rank amongst big game, small game? Like, what do you do? Uh, yeah. So we <clears throat> we got started, or I got started coyote hunting when I was probably 15 when like i got a phone and a smartphone and started watching videos and whatnot and these coyotes are just running dudes over and i was like yeah i want to be a part of that i mean that that needs to happen and uh you know <clears throat> uh i got my license and then started killing more coyotes and more coyotes and then started making really good relationships with uh a lot of the local ranchers and they started getting to the point of calling me and then I was like, okay, I, I can't handle this by myself. And then Mason, uh, he became a freshman, and I was a junior. <clears throat> and I was like, hey, dude, you have outstanding eyes. Your eyeballs are – you're you're an eagle. Uh, I must say, th I've noticed that since being out yeah. in the, the last well. two days with him. Yeah. Sharp. Yeah. yeah. No, his, eye, his eyes are out of this world. And uh, and I'm colorblind, so that I mean that works out great. Yeah, good partnership, <laughs> right? <coughs> and uh, yeah, and I I just started taking him. We rode around in what we call the Tan Wonder. She'll forever have that name, you know. And uh, we uh we started rolling around to that. And uh, the ranch we went on the last time you guys were up, that's where we kind of got kicked off on, you know, uh, with this whole. It's like a big family of ranchers that we do a lot of hunting for it started down there and then uh uh it just kind of a snowball effect the more coyotes we killed the more people talked about it and uh he and i just were like okay we need better guns we need better equipment i mean it was just constant and we're always getting something new yeah try it's, something it, it's like time to step your game up you're right. no longer in the little leagues you're in the minor leagues right yeah right. It's yeah like, it's we're not t-ball no more <laughs> i love it mace go ahead and uh what's your hunting background you know, Andrew got reached out to you to be a part of uh, minor league predator control. But what's your hunting background? Is it something you were born and raised with, or where, um, where do coyotes fall under all this? I uh, 
my grand my grandfather on my mother's side she actually got me or he got me into hunting um i took hunter safety with my stepdad when i was old enough to do so and i, I think i was eight years old when i took hunter safety it's so, somewhere in there and uh for my birthday one year my it's kind of a funny story i remember for my birthday my grandpa from my grandparents it was a little little box um little tiny box and he uh i opened it up and it just looked like a piece of paper to me i didn't know what it was it was the deer tag and i was like looking under underneath it I was, what does this mean well th there's your deer tag and then i went out that following year started out with my grandpa so for years on i went deer hunting with my grandpa started that shot a couple coyotes with him and then that's my first deer that I got with him there hanging on the wall behind us. Oh, that's awesome. And he got that shoulder mounted for me for Christmas also. So that's kind of a sweet, man. Yeah, it's 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 fun memories. I, I go down there every year now to yeah. try to hunt with him. Even if I, I, last year I went down there when I was in high school, I was pretty busy and couldn't always go down there every year for opening weekend, like ritual. We'd, we'd go uh, camp down there for a weekend, just have a good time. Yeah. He liked hanging out with his grandkids and this, that, and the other thing. So um, that's how I kind of got into it. And then once I got into high school, I kind of I had sports all the time during that time of year. Uh, I didn't quite yeah, have my life. It's tough to be a full-time hunter when you're playing high school football yeah. or just doing other sports. Basketball all that. and yep. all. I I played just about every sport in high school. That I played all kinds of different sports in high school. So uh, and then when I was a freshman in high school, Andrew and I we all always kind of knew each other growing up but we weren't like so-called best buds he's a little older than i was and uh then we started hanging our, around started out in football when uh we we played the same position in high school football both sides of the ball so we kind of bonded became good friends there and uh then we had went rode around everywhere my mom she always knew where I was at. I was with Andrew Witt that all, the, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> she knew where I was. If if I wasn't coyote hunting with Andrew Witt, I was out doing something else, and that's when she worried. But I was out. Yeah. Yeah, but we started started out coyote hunting with him, and it just took a, like a snowball effect, kept building up, building up, building up, and then we started doing it a, a lot more. That's all we do every single weekend. My mom would not see me on the weekends. She'd see me during the week. That's about it. And then we go. We're out searching for coyotes. Searching for coyotes. But big game and all that stuff, it's all a big deal. But coyote hunting is definitely a special thing. It's it's, it's the top a, dog. Yeah, it's a, there's a predator. It's that, that predator deal. And now it's even different than now that I'm working on this ranch. Yeah. The calves out here that are being born, it's my paycheck. You yep. got to keep those predators, and that's, like, the big part of about it now. That's the biggest thing to me now. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that before we dive into, like, the 101 and all that. Um, you <coughs> are a ranch hand. Yep. You you work on a cattle ranch. Yep. And your job is to just take care of the cattle. Yep. Make sure they survive and help them in any form necessary. Yep, any form. And a lot of that is carrying a gun and keeping predators away. Yep. You let the predators uh like if the predators are online like we we've been keeping them for the last couple of years it seems like um you don't have much for issues but back in the day you hear a lot more start stories about coyotes tearing apart calves and you see you still see that some but you let all those coyotes free roam they get brave depends on winners mm -hmm. all that it all lays into effect on on this yeah and uh yeah i always, always have a gun with me in the feed truck like I said, they're, they're my paychecks out there, and it's a big deal. You're earning it. Yeah, yeah, yeah got to earn it. So it's like a match made in heaven. You got a dude who started out coyote hunting and really made a name for himself amongst predator control. You got a dude who needs to make sure you manage predators on your ranch, and here you guys are, best buddies, slaying them, just getting after it and having a lot of fun. Um, going into the whole concept of predator hunting like how it's so big for you so getting back into like how i first started hunting six years ago i was a high school football coach and tony here was also a high school football coach and we wanted to hunt but it was like yo man we can't maybe get out for a weekend for deer hunting or whatever or you know but oh dude we can hunt coyotes year round you know you want to mm -hmm. go hunt coyotes you want to you want to go do this and i was addicted from the get-go tony 
I wasn't quite sold. <laughs> you weren't sold on it. More often than not, probably because what? Every time we went out, we weren't seeing anything. We weren't seeing anything. The one time, the the first time we six or when I was with you, when we successfully called in coyotes and I was able to actually lock eyes, they were responding to us coming in. Then I was like, okay, I get it. <laughs> like we didn't get a kill that day. I don't believe it. Yeah. Until the next time we went, then you you killed the coyote and even that even enhanced it even more there. Until I saw it and saw them coming in, I was like, this is kind of a waste of time. Like, I would rather spend my time deer, something I can eat, you know, like, not waste yeah. my time because I can't eat the coyotes. So why why spend time away to, yeah. to hunt them? Yeah. It was how I felt before. And now, last night, knowing yeah. that you just shot your very first one. Oh, man. What, what type of feelings you got? blood. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, today when we were out there, I was like, let's get after it, like, yeah. even more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It is something special, I tell you. And, you know, a lot of people don't even understand coyote hunting. No. There's a lot of misconceptions out there, and I don't necessarily have all the answers, but the point is, like, people say, well, the more you kill coyotes, the more there's going to have a, popu a higher population the following year. There's, you know... The, the government tried to introduce mange to them to take mm -hmm. them out. You have all these different things. You don't eat the meat, so how can you kill them? You know, it's the anti-hunter or the non-hunter view of it. Like, how can you kill something and then, and then not like value its life or you know? So it's a touchy topic. So number one, I want this to be an educational podcast for people to understand about coyote hunting. I actually view coyote hunting as the gateway, the gateway drug to hunting. You want to you want to learn how to hunt. If you get good at coyote hunting, you're going to be really good at a lot of other uh, big game, small game, upland bird. Because the more you're out in the field, the more you're going to start seeing other animals. You're going to understand how to play the wind because that is what almost number one when it comes to comes to hunting coyotes. First, They're smart. Yeah. yeah, maybe maybe number one is they have to be there first. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had That's to learn important. that a hard lesson. I remember posting that on social media one time, and I was like, "Yeah, it turns out, you know, part of the reason that you never see coyotes when you're hunting them is." Well, they're not there. You don't have any signs. So make sure that you, when you're hunting coyotes, there's actual sign of them. This spot would be really good if there were some coyotes here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so th there's all that, and so that that's like a, a podcast all in itself, separate. But I want to talk about more about the 101 aspect. I want to talk about what you guys do, and what you do to be successful. What are some of the barriers of entry? into predator hunting you know whether it's some gear or just the how to's uh do it right do it wrongs all that stuff so um man where to start right now mm -hmm. andrew you're first what if someone wants to get out and coyote hunt they need a caliber they need a gun mm -hmm. shotgun rifle rifle you prefer rifle yep a lot easier now now, also, let me just say this, that we're talking to guys who live more out on ranch land, right? So it's wide open country. You're going to be able to use binoculars and glass and see animals at a much further distance than if you're in like timbered area where you're only going to be able to see 100 yards and, and mm -hmm. whatnot, where you might be able to go with a shotgun or, mm -hmm. or close quarter. So you prefer rifle, small caliber? Uh, yeah, 22 caliber. So like a 22 to 50, 223 is okay. Um out here 204 it, it ain't quite enough you know coyotes over 250 yards if you hit them a little far back or something you probably won't find them yeah and i used to shoot one i, sh I killed a lot of coyotes with my 204 but it had to be a one holer i had to know exactly where it was going and uh then i started bumping it up i went and actually burned the barrel out of that 204 and i built the 2250 i've been packing mm. and uh um i shoot a 70 grain burger out of my 2250 now Boxed ammo, more than plenty. Yeah. I mean, it, 50, 55 grain bullet, done every time. Yeah. Like, there's no question in my mind. If you can hit them just a touch far back, they'll they'll fall right where they need to. Yeah. And a lot of people hunt with smaller calibers because they want to protect the hide. Right. So if for people who want to, you know, we have a, listeners, you can't see this, but we got a beautiful coyote pelt on this table here. And Mace, that was yours. Yep. One that you shot. Yep. 
beautiful. It's like white and black and like really something else. Really, I I have a coyote pelt that Tony, you actually tanned for me. Mm-hmm. Gave it a little soft tan. Hangs on my wall in my office, and it's beautiful. So I mean, we're not necessarily, you know, wasting the animal. That fur is uh, in honor of the animal. You also got I love a euro mount of a coyote skull. I think they're super sweet, Mace. You're gonna get your first one here pretty soon, right? I'm yeah, doing, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna doing do one with mine. <laughs> there you go. Last night, yep. So, <clears throat> so we got our different calibers. Um, you do hand call or or uh, electronic call. We've been using mostly electronic call, but today you did hop on a mouth call for a little bit. Could be a diaphragm, could be a little mm-hmm. closed read, open read. Uh, yeah. So when I started out, I had I think. I, for Christmas that year, when I told my dad, like, hey, I want to start coyote hunting, he's like, done deal. He got me, I think, four things. And it was a Primo's hot dog, really long howler call. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Another Primo's, like, rabbit call, mm-hmm. double cottontail or something, metal reed. It sound, it sounds good. It's, the, it's still a great call. Still call coyotes in with it. Um, and then... I had the Lil Dog, Primo's Howler. howler. They all came in a set, yep. by the way, if you couldn't tell. And then uh, the Randy Anderson, uh, Truth About Calling All Coyotes. Yeah. Um, and if you watch his videos, that guy, he he knows how to talk to coyotes in their language. And that's, that's where I started. I was like, yeah, talking to a coyote in their language and seeing how you can react with them, that sounds like a great idea. And I don't know how many coyotes I killed. Just this, those four things. Just watch, rewatching the video and making sure that like that, how he's setting it up and how I need to set it up, because he's down in Nebraska and we're up here in the Scab Rock. You mm-hmm. know that that's Plains land, so you got to set it up a little bit different. Your wind's got to be doing just something. You got to change the direction or how, however. Um, but yeah, I mean, a couple of mouth calls and maybe YouTube or uh, I read a lot of Outdoor Life. Um, cause we had, we just check them out in our library in high school and I just sit there in class and read them cause I didn't like listening to the teacher. Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he's saying that to a teacher right here. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so no, uh, and I, I read a lot of that stuff cause I wanted to be good at it, you know? And, uh, I put a lot of work into it and then, uh, you know, I started teaching Mason how I was doing it. And then once he started learning like how I did it and whatnot, and he started picking it up. He and I started bouncing ideas off each other, and then it got to the point where I don't know if you guys noticed it all today. We're like, we don't hardly look at each other, or if we do, we're discussing something pretty, you know, a, a lot of detail. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times we just start doing stuff. We were walk like that last stand we made before we came here. Um, I turned around to look at Mason, and be like, "You think that biscuit's right?" And he was already walking to it. He knew exactly where I wanted to be, and. Uh, you know, and that that just comes that we've sat next to each other on a stand hundreds of times. Yeah. You know, killed hundreds of coyotes sitting next to each other. Yep. So we we know how everybody's going to react, and having a teammate's great. It gives you more sets of eyes, especially when you got um have a lot of area to cover, you know, and or a lot of detail, like in well, when we were up in those biscuits. You know, having a lot of detail and having even three guns set up, I mean, that's that's sweet. Having yeah, that much covering yeah. the different angles, right? And listeners, all you, just in case you're wondering what a biscuit is, <laughs> it is a mound of ground. It's like a, a a relatively flat prairie with a bunch of mounds, so little biscuits. Right. They they rise up off the baking sheet, and animals can use it to hide behind, sneak up on you, break wind, all that. So, mm-hmm. was it the correct biscuit? Uh no, we haven't picked the correct biscuit all day. I think. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been it's been a rough go. Last night we finally got it together, but no, today was rough. But we were also battling battling weather, and uh, it's just been a rough year for he and I. I yeah. mean, it it just flat out has been. Well, when you guys uh, are in the minor league predator control business and you you're knocking mm. them dead every every year, it's yeah, you know, it takes a little while for those dogs to recover. Let's talk about this. Coyote hunting 101. Coyote, coyote. 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 <laughs> Tony, what do you say? I've heard Yo. him say both. Yo. I don't know. I just wanted to be different. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I've, heard, I, I've said both 
Yeah. On this so the first time I ever met Andrew, and by the way, listeners, so give you a little background is uh, this last November on a late buck hunt where I shot my first deer, I hosted a mentorship as conservation event up in Colville, Washington. And it was like, oh, I'm going to be here hunting. Why not throw an event, get some hunters together, meet people? And Andrew actually connected and drove all the way up there. How, how long of a drive was that for you? That oh, night? I know it was a long drive home. Yeah, uh, it's three and a half hours. Man, real close. Drove three and a half hours up there with his his beautiful wife to come to an event and and hang out. I guess is that <laughs> yeah yeah build community right. So the idea is that you know you got to start somewhere, and this hunting one on one episode is important, but also understanding that sometimes it just takes you getting out of your comfort zone and trying something new, and then you never know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Such as you come up to that event event three and a half hours, and here we are recording a podcast and, right. and hunting together. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, you never no, know it's what it's what, awesome. what's going to happen when you just put yourselves out there and all that. So now that we got it covered between coyote and coyote or yote, uh-huh. <laughs> tone. I don't think that's proper. You know, it's not proper? <laughs> they, they looked at me funny. All right. <laughs> so I found coyote hunting has got to be like one of the most frustrating things. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Ever. 100%. Like, like, you can be like, oh, I don't, I didn't see deer because I don't really understand the concept of food, water, shelter, or, you know, elevation, or north side, south side of a slope, and where the feed is, and, you know, whatever. But I feel like coyotes are like the, not to like sound bad, but like the rats of the, bi- of, of the four legged animals that they you can, can They hunt. can be. And they're everywhere. They're in downtown Seattle. They're in New York City. I mean, they're cockroaches and coyotes are going to be like the last two animals fighting for survival on, yeah. this, on this planet. And so you feel like coyotes are everywhere. You know, you see them in people's yards. They're taking house cats. They're, you know, all sorts of stuff. And yet here you are, or here I was hunting them, being like, oh, I go out into the, I go out into the woods or I go out onto, you know, uh, prairie or ranch land or desert, sagebrush, whatever it is, like I expect to see a coyote. If I blow a predator in distress call, something's going to respond. It doesn't work like that. No. no. The The most frustrating things is when you do get them to respond and they sit up there in a rock bluff way, way, way away and they just sit there and stare at you and they don't do it like that one did last night for a long time. Yeah. They'll, just, they'll do that all, all the time. But that's if you even see it in the first yeah. place. So let's but get. But it's almost worse to see them and then not, them not coming in and just taunting you the whole. T- <laughs> just taunting you the whole time. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Okay, so let's talk about setup. Let's talk about calls. Um, just before we get into that, do you call differently at night than you do during the day? Uh, you know, I, I don't. I try not to. Um, the only thing I might not use as much is howls. I yeah. might not try to talk to them as much. I I might use it to locate them. Yep. Um. But I I don't I don't try vocal vocalization vocalization with them at yeah. night. It it just I haven't noticed it to work. Um. That doesn't mean it doesn't. Uh huh. But around here, the way we hunt them, the way we set everything up, I haven't noticed it to work as yeah. as proficiently as in the daytime. Nice. So. Okay. All right. So, uh, what do you prefer to hunt, daytime or nighttime? I'd say daytime. Daytime. It, if it depends, on, like when they're coming in, I guess. Yeah. No. It 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 hundred percent depends on uh how they're moving. So like last night we saw five coyotes and we saw one today. Yeah. They just were moving more last night. Right. You know. So, um, it. I remember asking my dad a question. Um, when's the best time to kill a coyote? And he gave me the answer: when you see one. Yeah. Right. You know. So. <laughs> It 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 plays into that. So, if you're seeing them more at night, then guess what? Go out and go grab the light and go night hunting. Yeah. You know, if you're not seeing them, seeing very many during the day, you aren't going to kill very many during the day. Man, there's so much to talk about right here. Night hunting. It's legal in the state of Washington. It's legal in a lot of places. I never understood like like no one teaches you how to night hunt. Is that something that you guys just kind of figured out, or like there's a talk of like red light, green light white light last night we were hunting with white light and we still saw five coyotes yeah we had them them running right at the lights and 
it all depends is like I was I was kind of telling you guys earlier uh you get coyote to show up or something like that in the light uh, to me it doesn't matter what color the light is it could be purple for all I care yeah but just as long as you're keeping that light on them at all times you, you can see their body or just eyes or whatever but you keep that light on them at all times they can't see you but as yeah. soon as you take that light off of them you start scanning for another one He's like, oh, okay, there's something there. Or it, like, if you're hunting from a, uh, stand just standing there or whatever, however you're hunting, you can, they can see as soon as you take that light off of them, they have the upper hand then. But you keep that light on them the whole time. They can't see past it. And if they're coming in, they're gonna, they're gonna come in until they smell something or decide that something's. See, that's a great explanation right there. That makes sense. Yeah. So. This is kind of getting out of the organization of which I wanted to go. But the whole point is, if you want a night hunt, get yourself a light that reaches a good distance. Mm -hmm. Preferably rechargeable. That way you're not just smoking through batteries because you go through a lot, especially if you're going to be out at, for a couple hours at night. Yeah. Go stand in the middle of the field mm -hmm. and just take your light, swing it back and forth, maybe 180 degrees, maybe more, depending on where you're at. Yeah, sometimes it's got to be 365 degrees. Yeah. Is, yeah, and, and you're looking for eyeballs. Yep. And then I love it, 365 yeah. degrees. <laughs> yeah, you're I looking that little gonna, extra. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that extra five that. degrees really makes a big difference. Right yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that. It's that. Oh, was that? No, no, it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> you just <right>. keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where you that's gain that. that. It's that check. I love it. That, I love that, it. that check. Yeah. So okay, and then you're just you're scanning for eyeballs, and if you've never seen eyeballs at night, they literally are just little glowing things. Yep. And then once you recognize eyeballs then you get your scope on it with the light and then hopefully you see a, the outline of the animal yep. and you can actually identify it as a coyote not like a cow you know because it, hunting this ranch land there's cows out there also you, and calves calves are close to their size so you gotta be real real careful yeah real careful yeah and so and there you go so that's night hunting and have fun and then listen for the bullet and tony shot his very first coyote last night well, shot his very first coyote yep. at night. Yeah. What was that like? First of all, thank you guys for showing me and teaching me. Um, hunting at night is a whole nother ball game. Mm -hmm. Getting used to following the, because it's, I mean, we hunted until. I think it was three or two o'clock when we went. When yeah, we went back two a.m. I I shot my coyote at eleven p.m. So it's pitch black out. All you can see is that spotlight. And you're just following the spotlight, following the spotlight, and then boom, spotlight stops. Oh, someone's spotted something. You find the eyes. Next thing I had to get used to is scoping, scoping at a spotlight, and my eyes were trying to go out of focus and in focus and it was just something i had to get used to because i i've never done it before so it was definitely different and um luckily we saw several coyotes so i could practice before the time i was on the gun to where i was able to to shoot that one coyote so um yeah it was just it was crazy i loved it i'm super excited to do it again are you addicted now Oh, I'm addicted. I'm, <laughs> I'm in it. <laughs> you're, you're in I'm it. I'm in it. Like, let's go. You oh, know? that's so awesome. <laughs> All right, so we talked a little bit about night hunting. We talked about the light. doesn't really matter what color. Just get a light. Go out there. Check your – if it's on public land, it's on public land. It's legal. Sometimes it's good to recommend uh, calling a game warden in that department and say, hey, I'm going to be out with, right. a, with a spotlight. Um Definitely don't do it during like deer hunting season. You'll oh yeah, no, that's, that's big bad or or that's elk bad, bad. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. so no, you that's a big deal. <laughs> but in the in the winter time, springtime, summertime, mm -hmm. go get after it. Have some fun. Uh, calling setup. I know that you always want the wind in your face or crosswind. Right, right. So when you are approaching a stand, and a stand is just even though you sit, <laughs> you call it a stand. Ironic, except yeah. last night we were night hunting. We were actually we were standing. standing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you got the wind. You're always trying to approach it so that the wind is in your favor. Take us through Take us through your setup. What do you do? Uh, so it has to do with a couple of things. You know, you got to have the visibility. Um, you got to have the right wind. And you got uh, to be able to be comfortable in case you 
or for when that shot presents itself. Um, so it's it's always super cool when you set it up and it's like not a full crosswind, but not a full in your face. You've got that kind of diagonal wind. Um, and you you know we like to place the call a little bit upwind from us because they're gonna a lot of times it's like a rainbow. Say they're out in front of you and you got the call off to your right. They're gonna start coming in. It's gonna be kind of a rainbow out to your left. It, a lot of times, if they want to come in on a string, let them. I'll let them run right over the top of the call. That's so much fun. But it's going to end up being a lot more like a rainbow when you set it up like so. Um, you know, and being able to see them before they see you um, is a big thing. Having that cover, having, you know, if you can, have the sun at your back. Um, here we have a southwest wind, and we're in the northern hemisphere. That hardly ever happens. Sun's in your face or on the side of your face. It's it's it doesn't work out like that all the time, which sucks. But um, we've worked around it. We find a shadow. We sit underneath rock bluff. We break up our outline. And you notice that we we weren't wearing full camo today. We were wearing just enough that breaks up your outline. You blend in a little bit. Um. And uh, yeah, having having your outline bro uh, broken up is a real big thing because then you can get away with a little bit more movement when you got to move your gun. Um, and yeah, I mean, having, having all those things work in your favor and then obviously a coyote has to be there. And so I noticed today when we were hunting, you're always trying to hide your truck. Yep. So you're, you're, that coyote sees the truck, they're gone. They know what that is. They yeah. know exactly what that is. They've been shot at from, from that. They know that Mason's bringing the hammer and they better get <laughs> out of there. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so you hide the truck, you approach, you want the sun in your face, or not, sun, uh, wind in your face, sun behind you if possible, doesn't always work, you want elevation so you can see, um, then then what? I mean, do you sit down, do you let it die down for a little bit before you start calling, or pick out your shooting lanes, you range your dis distances, or what? what's your progression in which you're, where you're going about? We'll start out, and I normally, like, like we're doing today, start out, set up, set the call up, and then just kind of mellow out. And then I like to always glass with my binoculars before we start calling. And then every every once in a while, or a lot of times, uh, more times, sometimes depending on the year, like snow on the ground, coyotes are a lot easier to see. But you glass those coyotes up, and then you can pinpoint where or start like kind of planning where. You think they're gonna come to? Mm -hmm. You kind of get your gun in that position, and uh, before you start moving, and then as soon as they start moving, they go out. Of, you get your gun up, uh, get ready for them to come in. But always start out by glassing first, is what I do, and then uh, yeah, just, just <laughs> get after it. Yeah, you just gotta okay. gotta try it. You gotta try new things. Like we were using s animal sounds that. Just weird, weird stuff, and okay. it's curiosity a lot of times that'll get them coming okay. in sometimes. Okay, so let's talk about calling sequence. Randy Anderson, he always says, always start with a how. Mm -hmm. Male or female? Uh, a lot of times he just does a locator, so a lot, it, it could be both. And it, all, all the male or female that we can do is, you know, a high pitch or a low pitch. Um, I normally so start try to start out, if I do start with a how, is uh, – about middle range. I don't want to be too aggressive. I don't want to be, you know, if if there is a male in the area, I want him to think I'm a younger male. If there's a female in the area, I want it to think it's a male, right? And I, a lot of times you don't want to catch them off guard, but I use it as an attention getter. And uh, a lot of times that first howl, you'll watch them poke their head up. And they'll be looking like, you weren't there a little bit ago. You know, and starting out with that, it... It gets the ball rolling. It gets everybody's attention, that even the cows. I mean, they don't like it, but, you know, it gets everybody's attention, and everybody's now in, intrigued in what we're about to start. And uh, I like to say, uh, write them a book and read them like music. Yeah. Simple as that. And at the same time, treat them like house dogs. Yep. You can't punish a dog. You, see, you told me this back in November when I first met you. Mm -hmm. You don't like... You you know, owners, pet, pet owners are always told, don't punish a dog for something they did 20 minutes ago because they don't remember it, mm -hmm. right? So that you 
take that tactic and apply it to your hunting also. And so even if you screw up on a stand, you're still potentially going to be chasing that dog down because they're going to forget. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people say you can't. Ed- you can educate coyotes, though. Mm-hmm. So we'll get into that. But let's get back to the calling the calling sequence. Is your calling sequence the exact same year round? No, no, it varies. Okay, so uh, big game season ends. Now you have nothing to hunt except you know a small game. We're getting into coyote season. What what's your calling sequence? Late fall, early winter. Uh, rodents, rodent distress or. Pretty much, there's not really like that time of year. It's anything in distress. I think you can you can play anything, mm-hmm. but like like the late fall, you'll they'll howl, start howling a little bit. This this then the other thing, and then they uh we use a lot of distressed whatever. Just use something different sometimes. Just something off the charts or just like curiosity. They'll get to poke their head up, and then if they like what they're they're going to come check it out or what it is but r- fall time anything in distress winter where do you guys go what same you, thing same and thing it's just it distress. doesn't really it, it yeah distress uh and then start like coming into that uh february that that's when you start changing it up a little, a little bit and you start using a lot more vocals from that february and march that's their br- like their bre- heavy breeding season uh-huh. so they're getting super territorial then they want to find a mate they're pairing up. So you're using a lot more vocals and distress. You'll use a lot more like coyote distress, things like that, because somebody's in their territory or somebody's messing with their female or this female wants a yeah. mate kind of thing. So then you move into spring summer. What what you're calling for that? That that's when it gets kind of difficult. Um, as you guys can tell. Um the weather starts getting nice. They're all mostly paired up. Every once in a while, you find one that gets curious because you walk in on walk into their bedroom. Um, so you kind of you you work the vocals and the distress all in the same because you might find a hungry coyote or you might find one that hasn't found a mate or he's looking for a fight. Yeah, you know. So you you, you run both of them and you alternate them, kind of like we were doing today. You start out with a howl or start out with you know a vol squeak or. Something like that. You just change it up a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, you start rolling into summer. And about end of July is when the pups are really heavy here. And those guys are curious. And that is a great way to manage population that's hitting the pups. Because they're, they're not real bright. They're really curious. Um, they'll come to just about anything. I mean, you throw a rock and it hits another rock. They'll be like, what is that? And they'll, on top of it. I mean, they're, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's almost like shooting fish in a barrel, but it's a great way for managing these guys. Yeah. So. Yeah, because the coyote, whether if it's small now, it'll be big by the fall. Yeah. And yep. by the time calving season rolls around again. Yeah, they'll, it's, it's they'll a be b- plenty big enough to uh, get cause some damage yeah. by that time. Okay, so <laughs> distress calls. I mean, I know I've called in a coyote using bear cub in distress. I, you told me that you called in a coyote in alligator distress. Yeah. I know I've also called him in on house kitten, baby goat. I don't really, the stress call doesn't matter so much as it is just cause, creating a sound that's going to perk their interest, right? Right. Either it's curiosity or it's hunger. Mm-hmm. And then you're trying to play it, figure out, or, or mating, obviously, if it's during like, you know, February, March. Yep. All that. But uh, those are the three things you're really focusing on. The, any, any, anything that like, you wish you would have known when you first started hunting that you know now that you would like to that that's good to pass on. That's a tough. That's one. kind of that's a, kind of a tough question to ask because it's or a tough question to answer, I should say. But I don't know. You, you learn a lot of things al- along the way. It's, sometimes it's little things and just kind of piles up. You don't even like you just do it kind of thing, and then it works. You remember it, but I don't know. We don't really do anything. We do d- do things different than we when we started out, like how we, st- like we used to when we first started out. We go sit up on top of in the wide open on top of a rock or something on the skyline. Now we don't like think about that. Coyote can see you on the skyline, so there's just kind of things like that, mistakes that you, we learn from more, not as much as changing th- how we've done things. It's just 
learn from the mistakes kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Tony, what have you learned so far? Like, what are the, the things that really stuck with you as far as, like, do you feel like you know how to coyote hunt? Um, I think doing it now several times, being able to see them and um, recognize what it looks like in the wild, especially if you're not used to to hunting them. It's like, what does it look like compared to a deer or other common things that you see? So seeing multiple coyotes now, it's like I I can pick them out better because I have practice in it. So that's that's a lesson that's been learned. Another one is the calling sequence because I've gone a couple times by myself where I brought my brothers because usually I would just go with Johnny <coughs> and he would always call. And um, I have an electric call and I was always nervous to call because I was like, what do I do? What's the sequence? I don't want to mess it up. And learning that, like when I heard the alligator thing, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, really, you're just like throwing it, it out there. It could be one thing and then it could be another thing. And that's mm -hmm. what got their interest. And it's like, so it took pressure off of me to like, like, I can go out and just try it and maybe this, maybe that and not have to worry about I'm going to mess this up. Yeah. Which, you know, I could mess it up, but it's not necessarily my calling. Right. Maybe volume. Like, I, I noticed that you guys start at a quiet volume, and then you'll build as the stand progresses, you know, mm -hmm. as as we're getting into, like, 15 minutes, maybe you're calling way louder than you were when you started. You don't want to blow out the area. So volume, I'm sure, can, can mess it up, but not not necessarily the type of right. stress calls. or Yeah, things. and on that calling thing, or the, the volume, um, a lot of times when I start quiet like that, it's – it's because if there is one close, I want to call him in, and I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily educate. I guess we could say yeah. everything in the surrounding area, because if we call one in and it's nice and quiet, the other coyotes in that area, after they heard that gunshot, can't relate the two of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. if I call him in on baby cottontail, and I have another coyote sitting out on a bluff that watched this coyote die after hearing baby cottontail. He's not going to want to come to that again. You're not using that again. Right. <laughs> uh, not on him anyway. Right. right? right. So it, it's that kind of idea behind what we're doing. That's cool. I love it. Well, one of the cool things about, like, the calling sequence last night is you started out with vol squeaks. Mm -hmm. We picked up eyeballs. And um, with that, the, the coyote never came in. We just saw it sitting up on the hill. That was probably, what, maybe 500 yards? Yeah, it was, it was a poke for it, sure. Yeah, it was quite a ways out there. But then we were like, well, it's not leaving. It's staying there. We tried some different calls. Still, nothing was coming in and making it happen. At that point, we decided to move forward, close the distance on the coyote. You kept the light on it the entire time. Yep. And went back to vol squeaks. Yep. To start it all over again to see, okay, now the sound has moved. Maybe that's going to get it and what well, instantly. It took, what, 25 seconds? Yeah. And he was barreling off that bluff. Yeah. So. Man. And so I think that was really cool on the calling. Now, do you guys just let a call play forever? Like, do you have, do you like three minutes on, one minute off, five minutes on, one minute off? Like, what do you, or is it really just like whatever you feel like at the yeah, moment? It's kind of, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a feel thing. If I felt like I've played something too long, I've played it too long. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't feel like it's been long enough, I let it go a little bit longer. Yeah. If I feel like the break needs to be a little bit longer, um, it, I'm going to make it a little bit longer. I have a timer on it, so I try to time it kind of, but it's not down to the second. I mean, it, it could vary 25 seconds either direction. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not a real big deal on that, except for maybe when you're vocaliz vocalizing with them. You know, that that is a timing thing. Okay, so, like, don't let it go on longer than, like, three howls or something? Or right. So, in in on the Fox Pro, it's got a certain sequence, right, as one sound. It's one track. I play that track through, and then I stop it. And then they answer. They're expecting a response in a certain amount of time after that. You know what I mean? So, they, they see it. It's almost like calling elk. There's... They see it as a, oh, they should have responded by now, or they left. 
you know, so they're going to either lose interest or be curious. Hmm. That's yeah. interesting. I like yeah. that. I like that. So one of the things that let's talk about hollering at a coyote. <laughs> the old bark stop? Yeah, the old, the old bark ba- stop. The old bark stop. So so for new hunters, one of the most frustrating things is, like, you spot a coyote, and maybe at that exact moment, it's all of a sudden trotting away, or it came in hard, but you're trying to get it to stop so you can shoot. And, yeah, what do they're, you, what do constantly, you do? they're constantly moving. Like, if we get some more coming in tonight, I, I don't know if you noticed last night, Tony, but... Those coyotes, when they're coming in, they're sniffing around everywhere. Their head's on the ground. Their head's up when they're coming in. If they're coming in like that one was, kind of jogging and trotting in, coming in. But they're running running around like that. It's hard to shoot a coyote on the run. When it's moving, sw- uh, swerving back and forth, zigzagging, sniffing the ground. They're curious about just about it, anything. They're like, oh, my puppy that I got here. Yeah. And they're curious about stuff. They smell something new. Oh, I haven't didn't smell that earlier. And they're just smelling stuff like that. But. Yeah, then you get the bark stop into them. You just make a noise. Sometimes you can whistle at them. Um, Sometimes I've honked a horn at them or like lip squeaking when we saw that one last night right away. He lip squeak, kind of got his attention. He started kind of making his way over towards us. But you do bark stop, whistle, whatever. They stop like. Give me a bark uh, stop. Go! Hey. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, or anything that <laughs> I, I've honked, ho- I've honked horns at them. They've stopped. It's it's, it's something a, a to noise. get their attention. Yeah, yeah, and then they'll stop. And you, sometimes you got to be very quick with what you're doing. Yeah, if they're running straight at you, they really want that call. Sometimes you don't. You're not going to stop them. And then if you make too much noise, then they pinpoint you. It's just kind of a you got to know the timing when to do it. You got to have be ready at all times. I would say it's a cat and mouse game, but it's actually more like a human and coyote game. Right. Right? It's almost exactly like that. <laughs> oh, so it's all like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, more on the bark stop, it, it's a lot of it reading him. So that one today that we not necessarily called in, but kind of spooked up, Um, you noticed how I barked at him, and he wasn't even looking at us. He hadn't seen us yet or nothing. I barked at him, and he <laughs> hit the brakes. And if you were watching the way he was running, he was kind of doing a dog trot. Mm-hmm. Um, we call it we call it checking up because he's wanting to take that next look. He's wanting to look back at what the heck that was, you know. Um, so reading them, and when they start doing a really high hop when they're coming in or they're leaving, they're getting ready to stop again. So that is a great time to bark stop them. I mean that it, you want to hit see them hit the brakes, they'll kick dirt up and the whole works. They're done. Yeah, I mean, they're stopped. Yeah. Sometimes you have a half second. Sometimes you have three and a half minutes. You know, it's it's all in their head but yeah Yeah. that's awesome let's talk about the distance uh of timing so a lot of people i've always heard rule of thumb is 30 minutes on a stand and if you want to call in a cat an hour right it is a long that's hard to sit there yeah yeah, for that long so i noticed today like we had a couple stands in a row where we weren't seeing anything and i was getting bored Mm -hmm. um and you know maybe a little bit frustrated also or or whatever the emotions kind of arise so we talked about you know maybe speeding up our stands you mentioned your 8 10 12 rule what yep. is that so the 8 10 12 rule actually i i read it in a magazine from big al morris from fox pro fur taker big al yeah. shout out to big al he's yeah he's one I, of my heroes. i learned it from him and the way i understood it when i read it was if you see him at 8, wait till 10. If you see him at 10, wait till 12. If you don't see him by 12, leave. On to the next one. You know. Um, and we started doing that. And, uh, you know, it it worked on that one stand, kind of. Um, but, I mean, when we're wanting to make a lot of stands and, you know, having you guys here, we don't have a whole lot of time. Yeah. So we want to get as many stands in, see as many coyotes as possible. Maybe we don't kill some, but hopefully get some on video, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, fun, so it's fun to see wild animals, man. Right, it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, using that eight, ten, twelve rule, um, we do it in our coyote derbies. We're making you know stand after stand after stand, and I mean your legs get worn out because like during a derby, sometimes you're you're not quite running, but you're you're moving. You're you're going over rocks. You're hurting yourself. I mean you're going for it, and uh, yeah, it just speeds up, gets you a lot more um, 
gets you a lot more uh, interaction and a lot more ground covered. Um, and, you know, along with that 8, 10, 12, 8, 10, 12 rule um, today, we're using the wind to our favor, believe it or not. Um, we were able to make more stands in one area with as heavy a wind as we had. That way, if you're uh, hunting on foot, mm -hmm. you can hit more spaces right. along mm -hmm. your trail or whatever. That way, in case you're not in a place where you can just drive your truck right. every so often. Yep. You guys you have any uh, any tips on getting access to private property, like ranch land or anything to hunt for predators? It's obviously more often than not they're going to shut you down for big game. It seems like until they you build that relationship and that trust. Yeah. But when it comes to off season hunting, coyote hunting, is there any any rules that you follow or how do you go about getting access? Uh, I don't know. I've never really had an issue with it. Like growing up in a small town like I am now, so you, a lot of people know a lot of people, and it's a little easier to get on places. But, um. I, it's kind of a hard uh, question to answer again, because I've, like, I work on th this ranch, uh, and uh, I've worked on other neighboring ranches, helped them brand calves, kind of how we got our permission, we work to get paid, and that our payment is hunting, or yeah. cow hunting on their ground, and so that's kind of how, we, that's how we got the ground that uh, we can hunt on, we didn't go knock on doorsteps, and, but, like, I've, I've never done it. Yeah. I've On this podcast, it. we always talk about you can't outgive good. Right. You can't outgive good. You've heard me say that, I think, mm -hmm. at uh, the, the event back in November. You What you just said is that you can't outgive good. You go help and support somebody in what they're doing, you know, whether it's monetary payment or hunting payment or granting access. or At the end of the day, it's about building community, building relationships, building trust. Investing is a big thing. Investing in someone else's life, and then in return, they then invest in yours. Maybe it's your hobby. Maybe it's your passion. Maybe it's your actual uh, job. But whatever it is, it, this is how the world works, man. You give, and you're never going to be able to outgive good, and it's always going to come right back to you. Yeah, but the only advice I could I could give is you ain't going to get it if you don't ask. Oh man, I have I've talked about this on the podcast before with my brother. Uh, he gave me some great advice uh, back in my younger years before I was married. I was like, I went to my brother Lucas. A shout out to my bro Luke. He's a hero of mine. Um, he, I was like, bro, I want a girlfriend. I want to ask this girl out. I got rejected. He's like, oh man, don't don't get don't get hurt. Don't worry about it. He goes, let's say you got a thirty percent chance of a girl saying yes to you when you ask her out. He's like, that's not very good, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay. You ask out 10 girls, you all got three that are going to say yes. You ask out 100 girls, you got 30 girls that want to go out with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you don't ask, you're never going to find out. And yep. that's the whole point is have some courage. Yep. Take a step. Get out there. Go knock on doors. Go volunteer to help. What's one of the biggest things on ranches they need help with? Uh, is it fixing fences, fixing gates? Yeah, there, what there's, is al there's always things. That bale and hay? Hay, like some people that do small bales and stuff like that. Um, a lot of ranchers around here are older older people, men and women, that are just a little older and they can't do the things, like not trying to be mean or anything, but they, they can't do the things that they used to. And uh, having, like, me growing up, high school, that – working on these l little ro local ranches or bigger ranches and stuff like that, helping them load hay bales up into the hay lofts, just things like that. And then that work there for a while, grant you, start to grant you permission. So, yeah. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Hey, one of the things I want to ask you real quick is like, so within the concept of mentorship as conservation and giving back to the next generation, whether it's an adult or a kid or whatever, coyote hunting, you need a gun, you need a some type of call. If you're going to hunt at night, you need a light. Those are pretty much the three mm -hmm. things. You don't need camouflage. You don't need all these extra special gizmos, gadgets, whatever it is. What is it that you feel like you always need and you always want to have with you either on person or in your truck or in your vehicle 
when you're hunting. Putting you guys that, on the spot. You guys, come on that, now. That kind of seems like a, a, well, a gun. I don't know. That's the no, <laughs> no, you're going to have your gun. You're going to have your gun. You're going to have your call. Like, what other items? Like, do you wear a certain type of boots? You, oh, you, you want to be, be, you be yeah, do you want a bipod, binocular. shooting sticks, yeah. binos? Like, what is it gotta that... got to be comfortable. What is it that you always carry with you or you know you always have in your truck? Uh, binoculars. Um, I have I normally always have a bipod on my gun. And then those... Uh, backpacks that we're carrying around today i normally have like if i'm going coyote hunting that makes things a ton easier carrying that on your back and not and having a tired arm carrying a gun long ways into the stand but binoculars backpack and other than that that's your go-to yeah yeah andrew you got any if i'm hiking different? into a stand that is like that is yeah it. yeah okay uh yeah so I'm a little superstitious. Superstitious. <laughs> I gotta have a gray and black hat. Uh huh. Every time, if I'm hunting something else, we ain't gonna get nothing done. Is my hat gray and black? It, it is, is gray and black because I told you that this morning. Is it bad superstition because we didn't get to shoot any today? Well, I think I'm wearing the wrong hat, man. It's your fault. <laughs> hey, you I, I, need, to, I need to wear my muley freak hat. I, that thing's just about black on black, man. <laughs> yeah. I wore that forever. <laughs> I can't tell you how many coyotes we killed underneath that hat, and he had a dead eye, dead eye hat with the same thing. Yeah. So, oh man. So, uh, listeners, those of you got to go check out Minor League Predator Control on Instagram, Facebook. Facebook. You got a Facebook, Facebook page yep. now, and and uh, how how what is it? It's minor league predator control all all one no spaces or anything like that that's yeah the his had a instagram so minor league predator controls uh it's i'd have to look i don't even remember i've had it for so long uh <laughs> i think it's minor league predator control underscore 24.7 uh-huh uh on instagram and then on facebook it's minor league predator control um no spaces on on the ig i love it Minor League Predator Control right here. IG. Follow back. Done. Right there. Soulful Hunter Podcast. Just started following you guys right then and there. Um, Facebook page. I noticed that was something that just popped up not too long ago, right? No, no we've, we've had, had it for that, a couple of years. We've had that for a while. Oh, maybe just hit across my feed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. I love it. What what things do you want to leave the listeners with as a takeaway? Don't, don't get discouraged. I it's mean, tough. We, yeah, I mean That's it is tough. tough. It's tough, but I it, mean, as soon as it, it takes out one, and then like Tony said, you're addicted just like that. You get that one that's barreling in at you, but yeah, you just gotta get out there. You just gotta get out there. That's the biggest thing. Man, you know what just struck me right now? Do you guys play golf? Uh, I have. I'm not. I don't there. really care much for golf personally. Yeah, I but, don't either. But when you play golf, you can hit the worst balls all day long, and then you hit. One nice shot, and you're yep. like, okay, I got this. Yep. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then you yeah. want to just kind of keep at it. So the whole point of that is, like, don't get discouraged. Yep, yep. It's only going to take one. And I, I'm, I'm going to come out and say it. it's not easy during coyote hunting. It's, it's really hard. Sometimes it's – and then as soon as it happens, then you're like, oh, you try – you're going bang, 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 and then it starts slowing down again, and you're like, okay, yeah, well, uh, what do I do now? And you so you have a bunch of things running through your mind. What do you need to do next? What do you do different? And then it works again. Yeah. And then you try that for a while. And and, and so this is coming from guys who you've won uh, the local coyote hunting competition the last how how many years? Two. Last two years, you've taken first place. Yep. So you've gotten good at your craft. Yeah. But it's not always like that. No. So I know the first time I hunted with you, we went. Uh, man, do you remember how many stands we went? Oh, dude. Uh, I think it was like we were, 16 without even seeing it. We were getting it. worn out. Yeah. And so that is with guys who know what they're doing. So for someone who's new getting into it, like, stay after it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, stay after it. And, you know, more on the stay after it. I mean, me and Mason in, oh, 2018, we, between the two of us, shot 84 coyotes. Last year, I think we shot 79. Somewhere in there. Yeah, so an average roughly 80. And the year before that, it was like 82. Okay, mm -hmm. so an average about 80 coyotes a year. And that's with full-time jobs and school and, you know, whatever. And now we're rolling into this year, 
in 2020 that, dude, we've struggled all year long. Yeah. It, and you know what? It ain't going to change a thing. We're still going to get out there. We're still going to throw that fox door down. And we are still going to shoot every coyote that comes into a stand. Well, so here's the uh, the the other things. We're going to wrap up this podcast here in just a minute because we got to go get out and start mm-hmm. yeah. doing some calling. Yes. It's uh, getting late. It sun the sun is getting down. We get a little last stand with light, and then we got to wait for the the total darkness. But guys, I want to thank you so much for having you on this podcast. Also, thank you for bringing Washington Backcountry and Soulful Hunter podcast yes, into your you. home and and allowing us to hunt with you and, and learn from you. Yeah, thank you guys. This is for my very first podcast here, and this is definitely a pretty cool experience. Yeah, no, thank this you for is that. Su- this is super cool. Oh yeah, uh, totally, uh, listeners. Make sure to go check out Minor League Predator Control on Instagram and on Facebook and uh, get out there and try it. Go have some fun. You know, it, and one of the things I learned when I was when I got into hunting is like every time you're scouting, it's coyote season. <laughs> yeah. Bring a gun. Yeah. Uh, I was telling these guys earlier today, I, I'm, I was in full swing mule deer hunting this this last fall and I had some big bucks that I tried really hard to get, you know. Coyote steps in front of me with a bow. I'm I'm He's I'm letting an arrow fly. Swinging. It's yeah. coyote season, it's baby. Coyote season. It's a thir- thirty dollar <laughs> arrow that I'm at least that I'm sending down range, and uh, <laughs> I love it. And I do it. I'll do it every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. It's totally worth it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, make sure to go check them out. We're gonna also be releasing some some pictures and hopefully a hunting video uh, to go along with this podcast. Lord will and knock on wood, all that, and see see how it works out. But uh, make sure you go check them out. Just remember that mentorship is conservation. If you want hunting to last for generations to come, it's not just uh, buying hunting tags and licenses and voting for legislation, all that. It's also investing in people's lives, making a difference. When you hook the heart, you hook the person. And if you can leave a lasting legacy of love with someone else, and get them to understand how much you care and what you care about, it's a lot easier for them to fall in love with it also. And that's where the mentorship is conservation part is. And that's all about loving people, recruiting new hunters, continuing to do what we do and sharing it with other people. I love hunting. It's I transformed my life, yeah. man. That's all I do. My yeah. free time is pretty much so uh, great outdoors, man. Oh, dude, the great outdoors. It's not the okay outdoors. It's not the good outdoors. It is the great outdoors. This is what you get when you hunt will absolutely transform your life. So, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to go ahead and leave a review and subscribe to the podcast. Also, if you want to get a hold of us at all, go to soulfulhunter.com. Go to the Contact Us page. Drop us an email, or you can DM us on Instagram or Facebook. And as always, everybody, stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com and be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful.